chapter 21. Welcome everyone, and we are now back to uh, week 13. This is lecture number I don't even care anymore on Math 140 Business, November 23rd, and this will be a review for all the things that you need to know for the test a week from today. How do I know it's all you need to know? Because I'm writing the test. So trust me when I say, this is all you need to know. So uh, the test will have two parts, confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Uh, confidence intervals come in two situations, means and proportions. And with means, we also have two situations. What are the two situations, the two subdivisions of means? I think if you know the standard deviation and if you don't, or so that is a subdivision and that's the correct answer but what i was going with was a one sample versus a two sample situation okay but you're right i mean even within them um there's knowing sigma and there is not knowing sigma as um some of the decisions you need to make before you decide which button on the calculator to go to for proportions there was one proportion and there was two proportions. And what was the subdivision for proportions that would make us decide what to do in different situations? Anyone recall the, <laughs> huh? The size is big enough or? Yeah, the small sample, large sample versus small sample situation. Large sample versus small sample. I am not, just so you know, gonna ask any questions, although I can't promise they won't be in the final, but I'm not gonna ask any questions on conditions that to, to be ensured to be allowed to use confidence intervals or hypothesis testing. You know, it has to be from an SRS, they have to be from a normal population. Has, this has to be, you know, all that stuff are not things that I really focus on. I focus on, knowing which buttons on the calculator to go to and interpreting the results. So I'm not going to ask any questions on um, when you're allowed to use various things. What you need to know for each one of these eight situations, you need to know which button to press, where to go to, how to plug things in. So for means, you need to know X bar, if it's one sample, uh, or X1 bar and X2 bar, if it's two samples. What are some other things that you might need to know to plug in, depending on the situation for means, besides your X bars and your, or and besides your X bars? Your standard deviation. Yes, either sigma or S sub X, or S sub X1 and S sub X2, depending on the situation again. Uh, anything else you need to know for the mean situation for your calculator? Is it the um, size, the sample size? Yeah, exactly, the sample size, either N or N1 and N2. Again, depending if it's one or two. So if you look at your calculator, and you look at the different situations for means, for confidence intervals at least. So stat, tests, uh, I have the Z interval. I have the T interval. I have the two sample Z interval. I have the two sample T interval. So those are the four intervals for means. When do I use Z versus T? When you have, um, if you have sigma, you use uh, Z. If you only have the standard deviation of the sample, you use T. Great. And I forgot one thing that you need to, uh, uh, one more. You also must know the number of degrees of freedom. If you have one sample, what's the degrees of freedom? How much? Zero. No, it's not zero. Mm -hmm. If you have one sample, what's the number of degrees of freedom? I'm not looking for a number. I'm looking for a formula. 
How many degrees of freedom for, for, a, for a single oh, sample? N minus one. N minus one. If you have two samples, how many degrees of freedom are there? How was that? Two samples, how many degrees of freedom? It is yeah. the, the minimum. Minimum, yeah, N1. N1 and N2 minus one. Or that. Or, or, or you said it, or calculate it. I said, or that long equation. Yeah, but you're not, I'm not gonna ask you to actually use the long equation, but you should definitely know that the calculator uses that long equation. Well, professor, are you going to ask us like um, how to do, do the plus or minus of the equations for the con confidence intervals? What like, do you mean? Am I going to ask you how to do the plus or minus? Like, are you going to ask us to find, um, let me find the equation, like Z star sigma divided by root of n? I mean, I might. I mean, I'm not going to give you any data set with like a, a thousand data points. Um, but if I give you, you know, 10 to 15 data points, you should be able to use your calculator to uh, to complete the, you know, it, if I ask for it, you know, S or sigma or not sigma, but S or, or X bar or something like that. Okay, because on some of the like questions, they sometimes ask us for like the plus or minus of the equation, like no. Well, you mean the Z star sigma over the square root of N or the Z star S over the square root of N? So yeah, well, if you have a confidence interval, you know, every confidence interval always has the same form. It has the center, it has the center points plus or minus the margin of error. Yeah, so, you ask for the margin of error. I, I, yes, I mean, if you if you computed the confidence interval and you have like from one to three as your answer, uh, you should know how to get the margin of error from that. And you should know how to get the center from that. The center, I guess, better is the point estimate. Maybe it's a better word. What's the margin of error for this example? Would it be one? Yeah, the margin of error is just center to the edge. Center is two. So two to three is one. You should certainly know how to do that. Okay. All, all these little computations and understanding what the formulas mean. It's not, this is not just a calculator test. I'm not going to ask, you know, deep um, sociological questions like, you know, what are some reasons why this might be true or that. It's all going to be math-based, but it's not just plug things into a calculator and get an answer. You do have to know what everything represents. Um, but in this regard, I can't think of anything. I mean, you have to know your formulas, of course, in that regard. Cheat sheets are allowed. Well, it's, it's a take home. I'm, I'm, I might be going to, no, no, you'll be there. Last last time it was books or open book tests, right? Yeah, and like our notes too. Yeah. yeah. So I would recommend, you know, for your notes, rather than, I mean, if you take the whole book and you're, and you're flipping left and right to find formulas, that's going to take a lot of time on the test. I, I don't recommend relying upon that, but you should certainly have on your a cheat sheet. I would even divide it into confidence intervals on one page, hypothesis tests on the other. You have one section for one mean, two means, and, and no sigma, don't know sigma, and small sample, large sample. Basically, have every little thing you need for each thing. And the first thing you should do for every problem is recognize, OK, which scenario is this? Is this a test? Is it a confidence interval? If it's here, do I go here? Do I go there? At least be in the right ballpark and have everything you need in one section so you don't have to keep bouncing back and forth. But you should know all of the formulas that you're going to be, that the calculator is using, other than the degrees of freedom one. You should know them. You should have them written down so that you could actually um, solve for things like that if I ask. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, for confidence intervals. So what are some things we might need or uh, use for confidence intervals? Uh, for proportions, I mean, I'm sorry. H naught. Wait, never mind. I thought you switched. Yeah, still on uh, confidence intervals. How about like when we did the like 90%, 95%, and 99% and we had to like, um, you had told us like if, if, if it was like 90%, it will always be like one number. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're talking about your Z, your Z stars. 
sorry. Yeah, you should certainly know your Z stars. I mean, Z star uh, for 90%, 95%, 99%. But I might very well say, do it for 86.2%. You should certainly know how to calculate that in your calculator, no matter what I give you. And we did it in class, okay? When we introduced these three numbers, well, what are they, 1.645, 1.96, and I think it's 2.56? Yeah. I, I explained where those numbers came from and how to get them. And in fact, when I solve a problem, like if I'm helping someone and I'm doing a problem and they say, okay, it's 90%, I do this. I, I know how to get there. So I don't do 1.645, I get 1.644853, I can't even read backwards, but whatever that number is, so I can be as accurate as possible, okay? I don't use 1.645, I use this, because I know how to get them. Know how to get them. So if I give you a different number, you can get it. Um, but what are the things we need for proportions? We need uh, P hat or P1 hat and P2 hat. What else are things we need, we might need? Depending on the scenario. Well, P with the squiggly line on top. Yes, P twiddle and P1 twiddle and P2 twiddle. What else? There's also P hat in the situation where we pool them. That's actually hypothesizing. <clears throat> it's not in confidence at all, so let's not worry about that. Um, we might need to know the number of successes. So X, uh, X or X1 and X2, uh, the sample size or the sample sizes, right? These are all things that you might need to know, correct? Yes. Also, yeah. for, also for here, there's a formula for, for, for calculating the sample size. If I know the margin of error, Actually, that's on the other side, right? Z star over the margin of error times uh, P star one minus P star. That was a formula for determining sample size. Um, oh, square, don't forget to square that. Doo -doo. Am I missing anything else? Of course, know when to use large, when to use large versus small. I did say before, I'm not gonna ask um, conditions, but I didn't mean these ones. You should know when to use the large or the small so that you know which one is appropriate. The ones that I meant I'm not gonna ask are making sure it's coming from an SRS making sure the underlying, uh, the underlying uh, population is normal. There's no outliers. We don't have a lot of skewness. This, that, that I'm not gonna ask, but knowing when to use large versus small, that I might ask. Um, that, yes, no, maybe so. Good so far, bad? We're good, we're good. I can't think of anything else for confidence intervals that you need. I mean, you gotta know your formulas, of course, but in terms of actual things to know, I'm pretty sure that's it. By the way, the formulas are all on the front page of the book. All the confidence intervals. Maybe we should write them all down so they're all in one place. P hat, plus or minus Z star, square root P hat, one minus P hat over N. P twiddle plus or minus Z star square root P twiddle one minus P twiddle over N plus four. Uh, P one hat minus P two hat plus or minus Z star square root P one hat one minus P one hat over N one plus P two hat one minus P two hat over N two or P one twiddle minus P two twiddle plus or minus Z star square root P1 twiddle minus P1 twiddle over N1 plus two plus P2 twiddle one minus P2 twiddle over N2 plus two. 
And here we had x bar plus or minus z star sigma over root n. x bar plus or minus t star s over root n. x1 bar minus x2 bar plus or minus z star um, sigma square root 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2 x1 bar minus x2 bar plus or minus t star s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. Those I think are your only ones that you need for confidence intervals. So questions on confidence intervals and what you need to know, this is it. Every question on confidence intervals should be answerable, answerable by this information together with an understanding of what you're doing. Not everything is like, oh, let's find the right formula and plug a number in. You might need to know some conceptual ideas behind these things. Questions? No. Okay, now. Uh, professor, I get confused uh, when I was doing the homework. Yeah. Uh, probably chapter 18, when you do the mu minus, uh, like if it's less than zero, bigger than zero, or not equal that, to zero. That's hypothesis testing. It's not confidence intervals. Okay, uh, oh, so we're getting to that, right? Yeah, I'll do that right now. If there's no questions on confidence intervals, now we go to hypothesis testing. So the other half of the coin, hypothesis testing. First, before anything else, if the p-value is low, what do you do? Must let, let it go. go. P-value low, let the null go. And if the p-value is high, let it fly. Let the null fly. Some of my other class said the p-value is high, go eat some pie. I like the idea, but I don't see how it really connects with uh, your decision-making process. So in all cases, your null hypothesis will be something equals something. It'll either be mu equals a number or mu1, um, mu1, minus mu two equals a number, or it'll be P equals a number, or P one minus P two equals a number. The equality always goes with the null hypothesis. The mean is some number, the difference of means is some number, the proportion is some number, the difference of proportions is some number, our four cases. Notice, what does not appear in any of these is what? What does not appear in these four? So less than, greater than, or not equal to? 100% that. What else does not appear in these four? Anything involving the sample does not appear. Alternative? What? I was suggesting the alternative. No, 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 no. Nothing involving the sample plays any role in your hypotheses. I never want to see a hat or a bar in your hypotheses. These are the unknown actual values. These are some specific guesses, but there's no sample information here. Same thing for the alternatives, which is greater than, less than, or not equal to. We still only use numbers, no sample values. The less than case, low values are what are going to make us um, reject the null hypothesis. For the greater than case, it's high numbers. And for the not equal to case, it's numbers on both sides. Okay, but nothing about the sample makes its way into your hypotheses. I can't be any clearer on this. And you know what? I'm telling you right now, I'm going to ask a question or two on it. And I know people are going to get it wrong because they always get it wrong, no matter how many times I tell them. 
No, we're not. Well, you might not, but are you speaking yes. for the entire class? Yes, because I know we're going to get a raid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what. If everyone gets it right, if everyone in the class gets it right, I will treat you guys to pizza. All right, can you repeat it again? It's just no, just... too late. Okay, so moving on. So it's on video. I mean, it's on recording. You can you can listen to it later. Shit, and my well, what about what kind of pizza though? Uh, well, um, I, whatever pizza you want. I, I don't know. I mean, it's not going to be like Little Caesar crap. It's going to be like okay, cool. Some solid pizza, like either. Uh, Fernando's New York Pizza, that's my place that I go to, or maybe Mulberry's, that's a pretty good one. I found this place in Winneka that I really like. It's like a little hole in the wall. I was just driving by, I'm like, oh, pizza, I'm hungry. And I stopped in there, they had like a couch in there. Oh, pizza, hot, gross. They had like a couch in there, and it was like really nice. And I, my God, that pizza was good. You know, when you order a whole pizza and you eat it, and then you order a second one, and it's so good. That's what it was like. Anyway, moving on. So... We have our hypothesis testing. Um, what are our formulas for hypothesis testing? Well, in all cases, you're gonna compute your statistic. Either Z equals X bar minus mu naught over sigma over the squared of N, or T equals X bar minus mu naught over S over the squared of N, or, um, Z equals X one bar minus X two bar over uh, the square root of Sigma squared over N one plus Sigma squared over N two or T equals X one bar minus X two bar over the square root of S one squared over N one plus S two squared over N two or we have Z equals P hat minus P naught over the square root of P naught one minus P naught over N. Or Z equals P one hat minus P two hat over the square root of P hat one minus P hat one over N one plus one over N two. So you should know what P hat is. You should know what all these things are. P hat is just the total number of successes over the total number of trials. Um, okay. In all cases, what does the p-value represent? What physically, if I ask you for, if I'm not going to ask you this, but you should know it. If I say, what is a p-value? Oh, it's a number. Great, thanks. Okay, what is that number physically representing? What does it mean that the p-value is, you know, 0.2? The percentage of um, chances you have to have a number greater than or equal to the number. You... It's not bad. It's close because it, it, it might be left, less than or greater than depending on what kind of test you are. Um, but that's the basic idea. It's how likely it is if you perform the experiment again, to get a result that is as extreme or more extreme than the one that you got in your actual results. So if I take a sample and I get a result and I compute its p-value, the calculator says 0.2, that means there's a 20% chance if I did it again, I would get something even more extreme than what I got the first time. And if the p-value is low, on a heat, what do we do? Uh oh, low. yeah, what do we do? The p-value is low. We let it go. We let it go. So we reject the null hypothesis. Yes. And if the p-value is high. We let it fly. We let the null fly. We let it, we stick it, we don't accept it, but we don't reject it. We do not it. reject it. Yeah. Do not reject it. Um, yeah. So know what the p-value represents. All right. So now that we've gone through the major stuff, now we quickly run through all of the chapters just to make sure 
that we didn't miss anything of importance. We probably did. Some other things that I might ask, because I can ask, you should know statistical significance. You know statistical significance, which we used a ton. So definitely know that. Okay. Huh? Uh, maybe how to interpret the hypothesis test, like when it comes to like, if it doesn't have zero, then. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. If you have a confidence interval that doesn't have the value that, that you're asking about to know to reject or not reject based upon that a hundred percent, we, we did a lot of those, right? We did a bunch of those. So you should certainly know those. Um, we did. The law of large numbers, the law of large numbers. We did the central limit theorem. Oh, oh yeah, we did the matched pair the match pair t-test, which is a, basically it's a t-test, but you match them up. I can ask a question, which, uh, which test is appropriate for this scenario? Do we want to use the match pair? Do we want to use the, 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 the one sample t, the two sample t, the one sample proportion, the two sample proportion? I, I might very well ask a question like that. I'm not going to ask on robustness because I just don't like the topic. It might be on the final, but I'm not going to ask about it. Uh, I'm not going to ask on the true degree of free degrees of freedom formula. I'm not going to ask on that. Um, I'm not going to ask on power. I don't get the impression. Um, and really solidified, but I will ask on type one versus type two errors. Is this type one error? Is this type two error? Uh, there's a good chart on page 508. Copy it. Copy that chart. It's good for your notes. And also, Pages 511 through 519, questions 1 through 56. This is a solid review. You know, people ask sometimes, can I get a review guide? I don't give review guides, but if I did give one, that would be it. If you can do those 56 questions, you are good to go. I mean, <clears throat> no, not just those 56, you should understand yeah, more than just that. But, um, but yeah, if you can do those 56 questions, like if you can read one of those questions and just say, this is how you do it. Even if you don't actually do it, if you say, I know how to answer this, then, uh, then you should be just fine with this test. And if any of the questions in there talk about robustness or they talk about, um, you know, SRS is, you know, needing an SRS or, or this or that, you can ignore those. Otherwise, that's it for my review. What do you think? Who's going to do amazing in this test? I think it's good, but I, I just want to know, like, when you use the, the hypothesis testing, like when you're using bigger or smaller or not equal, how do you know which one to use based on the question? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, a lot of it comes from, I'm hey, give me a second, but a lot of it comes from, um, you know, a careful reading of the question and understanding how to interpret it. Uh, it's not always going to be spelled out greater than less than or, or not equal to um you know if if you know if i think that my students cheated 
on a test because their grades were higher than normal. And I said, you know, I think you all cheated because because grades are never this high. So I'm giving you a new test and you're taking it in front of me. I don't care if you get higher on the second test. That's not going to justify my belief that you cheated. I want to see if you get lower. Right? So I just know in that case that it's a less than problem. I yeah. see. Yeah, there's just sometimes you just got to, you got to read it and just interpret it. There's not always, uh, there's no guide for that kind of thing all the time. Does that That's make sense what I'm saying? That's why I hate word problems. <laughs> yeah, me too. I get it, but you're, you yeah, see what I'm saying too. though, right? Yeah, it's just a word problem basically. You have to be able to like just interpret what, what they're saying. Exactly. And, and the more you do, the better you get at that. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no algorithm to, to help you, uh, Oh, I see that key word there. I, I know how to use this. It's just understanding. On the heat, what's up? I didn't say anything. Okay. Will you give me a high five there or what's going on? Oh, I had no idea. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Any other any other questions? So what time's the pizza party? Well, let's see how you guys do first. <laughs> But I just spent, I think I spent five grand in the last 24 hours. So a pizza party is like just a little icing on the cake. On the what? Where are you spending five grand on? I bought two new TVs, a new laptop, and I got a oh. new one. All of it. Well, it's like, um, no. no. By the way, no pineapple pizza. Whatever happens, there'll be no pineapple pizza. Just so you I know. I see that you are uncultured. I put my foot down and wow. Okay. I put my... <laughs> No pineapple pizza. That I will not allow. I will not allow that. Uh, anything else is fine. Although I'm I'm a cheese pizza guy myself. I never really was big on toppings. Anyone anyone feel me on that this one? Just just cheese pizza. Well, margarita is just like cheese and basil and like tomatoes sometimes. Yeah, so basil and tomatoes. No, no, I can't have that. Sometimes, like, sometimes the cheese pizza be hitting different. Sometimes, yeah. I, like meat lovers. Only if the crust is good. Crust, good, good crust piece is good. Medici. Yeah. Medici has really good pizza. It's like, like super thin crust. Is there a place called like Fresh Brothers Pizza or something like that? Yes, yes, yes. They have good pizza. Yeah, it's San Ventura. Yeah, Fresh Brothers is good. That's a square pizza place, right? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's good pizza. That's, there's some good pizza out there. But um, orange cream pickles is still the best. I'm gonna bring them. I'm gonna bring them on Tuesday. Orange cream pickle pizza. That might not be that good. Though. That might not work. But yeah, you want to bring them? Bring them. I'll, I'll I'll finish the whole box. I'll 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 devour that thing. By the way, remember the test is on uh, the second floor, not the first floor. You guys remember that, right? Are you gonna send us an email like you did last time? Yes. I don't remember that number to be honest. I wrote it down. Yeah. With Okay, all you gotta remember is second floor. It's not that big of a building. So what time's the test? I don't know, till 8 10. What time's class? Only oh, no class is over 8 30. It is so, not so you were joking yes, about it, it in the morning. It's 6 30 to 8 10. It's 6 30 8 10, but we usually get like 30 minutes out early. Oh uh, yeah. Sorry. Because yeah. I don't like to teach. <laughs> I like to get paid without doing anything. What can I say? Fair enough. No, the good thing about, me for that. I appreciate that. But the good thing about <laughs> I, I, the statistics course is, I mean, I, I can probably do more examples. Um, I could probably do more examples, but in general, the material itself, it's not that extensive. And like the last eight chapters have been like repeat, just the same thing in different scenarios. So the good thing about statistics class is that once you have the idea down for confidence intervals and hypothesis testing, you basically get one or two chapters you got to work, and then you get six chapters that go along for free. I feel like it's really nuanced. Like you have to look at like little different details. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. There's no question about that. Um, but um, you know, reading questions is you know the first thing you should do is read it make sure you understand what it's asking even if you don't know how to solve it at least know what it's asking 
and then decide, okay, how do I go about and solve this problem? But a lot of times I get the feeling some of my students, they just, they start writing without even realizing what it is that they're looking for. They just start writing. And sometimes it's just, take me back to algebra. You wanna to go to my algebra class, the one that my most advanced algebra class, I don't think you'd even recognize it as being math. Math 650, abstract al algebra for graduate students. Now that was a good course. Sounds complicated. It was. It was. Good times, though. What makes it abstract? Uh, abstract algebra. So here's the idea. Uh, and this is what mathematicians do in general. Suppose I want to prove something about the real numbers. You know, your, your good old-fashioned real number line. So the real numbers have lots and lots of properties. And I don't necessarily need all of them to prove what I'm trying to prove. Maybe I need like three of the things about the real numbers to prove what I want to prove. And I, I don't need all the rest. So what I do as an algebraist is I abstract. I say, forget about the real number line. Just say we have some object that satisfies these three properties. Then what I can do is I can prove whatever I want to prove on that object and not only have proved it for the real numbers, but proved it also for all the millions of other cases that would apply given those three properties. I abstract away from the concrete to a hypothetical scenario and I prove it for the hypothetical scenario. That's what we do as mathematicians. And if it sounds complicated, it, it's more complicated than that. Um, but it's very interesting. It's a lot of fun for people who like math. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, that's, what, that's what we do. So I have a text here. Can we do one problem from each chapter or do we not have enough time? Um, we probably could, but um, um, no, we wouldn't have enough time for one, one question from each chapter. But I remember last time we did the workbook. Do you guys? I, yeah. And when we did the workbook, we saw that there was like two questions on one chapter. It's like, there's not a lot. The questions are very repetitive. But what I would certainly recommend, and if you want, by the way, just so you guys know, I am, uh, I'm around for the week. If you guys want to jump on to set up right now a Zoom meet sometime on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and just- Yeah, you can do that. Sorry, what? I, I'm like, yeah, can we do that? Can I, yeah, well, I'm saying if you guys want, oh. if, you guys, if you guys want on Friday or Saturday or Sunday for me to set aside an hour or two and we can jump on Zoom, anyone who wants to show up and do problems, I'm more than happy to do that. Is that something that people would want? Sounds good to me. So let's pick a time then. Uh, uh, okay. So can't Friday. Okay. So somebody who wants to can't Clippers game. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. Far, far be it for me to, uh, to, um, you know, detract from your, your watching an inferior Los Angeles team, but okay. Um, so there is Saturday. I basically have on Saturday, anytime from, Noon to six. So here's what I have. I have Saturday, 12 to six. I have Sunday, let's see, she's 11 to 12, one, one, three, let's say three to seven. Um, yeah, if you want Friday, I know you can't make it Sebastian on Friday, but Friday, I'm free basically uh, two to six. So Saturday, who wants it Saturday? 4.30 to six Saturday? Does that work for anyone who would actually be interested in showing up? Yeah, that works. Yeah, that's fine. 4.30 okay. 4 to six, right? Okay, so I'll put it here 4.30 to six on Saturday, so stats. 
Uh, 4.30 to 6 o'clock. Unless anyone now says, sorry, can't make that one, we'll say 4.30 to 6 on Saturday. And then Sebastian, what we'll do is we'll just do problems. Um, I mean, I can certainly answer questions, but um, at the end of the day, just the more problems you do, but please, please don't just, don't just rely upon that. Don't just wait until 4.30 and say, oh, I'll just, I'll get everything then. By the time Saturday rolls around, you've eliminated half of the time between now and the test. So, uh, you know, take the time, study, get these things down, make your notes, make sure you understand the formulas and how to derive things. And then we'll spend an hour and a half doing problems. Sound good? Fair yeah. enough. So, so who, just out of curiosity, just put in chat if you intend to be there, whether you show up or not, but who intends to be there on Saturday? So Lorena, Caesar, on a heat, down five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, 11 people. Okay, maybe even more. And I, I, I guess not all of you will come, that's fine, but I will sacrifice my time for you because I care that much about my students doing better so that it reflects better on me. Appreciate you. No problem. Um, yeah. So any questions? How's your Black Friday shopping going, Professor? I told you I spent five grand, two TVs. I bought a new laptop. Here it is. That's my new laptop. Well, to my old laptop, huh? It's been more. Uh, Twenty five hundred bucks for that. It's a How little. Much did you save? That's the real question. Oh, I think I saved six hundred. Okay. I think I saved six hundred. And then I, I, I'm, I bought two new TVs. One for the downstairs. One for my bedroom. I'm gonna get the mountain mounted, and then uh, so I can, I can save a little room there. And then I bought my new phone. I was, I was deciding between the, the zip, you know, they have the new, um, the foldable ones. Oh yeah. But the guy's like, you know, other than the novelty of having a flip, uh, having the foldable one, he goes, you know, the, this one is just, it's just better in general. So I, I didn't need a, I didn't need the novelty. So next up is buying a new car. I need recommendations. So what brand do you like? Well, my old car is a Prius because I like saving a lot of money on gas, which is great. But at the same time, I also um, want my next car. Now that I can afford a lot better car, I want a, a nicer model. Maybe a Mercedes. I want something nice. Uh, but it's also um, that also saves money on gas. Um, I was thinking, do you think Tesla, I mean, maybe a Tesla. Oh, their build quality that. is really bad, though. Like, oh, what's, 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 what's bad? The build of the car, like, it's it's not built well. Like, it, mean, it's very unsymmetrical all throughout the car. And they're, they're kind of known for, like, not having the best quality. But it's like, it, it, it is like a very advanced car i know i saw a friend of mine has that, that screen in the tesla is like yeah. it, it's very clean on the inside like it looks really nice but like the build isn't like consistent through, throughout the car okay okay hold on a second mando you are a car broker <laughs> yeah what does that even mean salesman I mean, i'm not a salesman at a dealership is this a broker side like not i don't work in a dealer i work outside like the dealer i get like any car you want if you want to sell the car i sell it for you so you're not you're not uh, um beholden to a certain model for example you can you know, no no i work in any model i see what the hell's a yeah. hellcat okay we'll talk we'll talk what the hell's a hellcat <laughs> get a camaro a you know, a Hellcat is a, is a nice car. A Hellcat's a nice car. The Charger. Okay. Yes, just look up. Uh, look up. Just look up. Uh, Dodge. Dodge Charger. Hellcat. Dodge Charger. Okay, one second. That's why I have my second computer now. I can look it up. Dodge Charger. Dodge Charger. The hell. 
that. Uh, uh, they're not good in gas. Yeah, I, I want I want a, a, a car that that I don't gotta spend a lot of money on gas. Oh, never mind. I was gonna say, look at the new Corvette. Oh. <laughs> get one of those. Uh, get one of those like micro cars. They're like two feet oh, long. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, this conversation is now <laughs> over. <laughs> no, I wanna. I wanna. I want a, a, a nice like like growing up. I remember like you know Alexis was a nice car. Um, I don't know if they still are or not. I don't know. We can talk. You guys can all brainstorm. At pizza, we can brainstorm on it. Okay, for now, 